Welcome to Inside the Skeb, and I'm your host, Aaron Maslansky. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, who represents the 9th District of Illinois, which includes the Skeb, Skokie, and Evanston, and many more areas uh, throughout town. And uh, just want to say thank you for being here. Oh, it's really my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Oh. It's, uh, it's really amazing, actually. I'm kind of pinching myself that I have the opportunity to speak with you, um, especially during these times, because I, I could talk with you for hours about a lot of different questions about what's been going on. Um, but this has been a, a, an interesting year. And you know, right now we're going through COVID, but at the beginning of the year, uh, we had an impeachment uh, trial that was going on with the president. Then we almost went to war in the Middle East with Iran. And then we have a pandemic to deal with. How do you prepare as a government for all these types of things that can come up? Well, we certainly were unprepared for the um, COVID-19 epidemic. There's no question about it. And we shouldn't have been. Um, we saw during the earlier years of the Trump administration a number of um, diminutions of our preparation that have left us more, more exposed. Um, in term, you know, I think about the freshman members. I'm in my 11th term. The freshman members began their service in a government shutdown, so the government was not functioning. Then they had um, an impeachment. And now they have this. Um, nothing, uh, all three are things that I've never seen before either. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of uh, a potential war, of course, I was very much in favor of the Iran agreement that prevented them from getting nuclear weapons and was very disturbed when that was um, undone. So, you know, world, worldwide, um, we're, we're seeing kind of a, a, a change in democracies around the world um, that are becoming less so. And I think even here in the United States, we're in somewhat of a battle to save our democracy. Um, so there's a lot of things um, that we, are, we have to deal with. Although we're, we're, we're preoccupied for good reason with um, the COVID epidemic uh, and pandemic right now. Right. Um, and of course, it has changed really the life of every single American right now. Oh, it's changed the life of everyone throughout the world. And, All over the world, yes. You know, what do we do, though? Because I think, you know, certain people, what we're dealing with right now, and I'm gonna, I want to get into some of the questions about what's going on, the government sure. response, and what you're doing. But, sure. you know, one of the things is that right now people are hurting. Whether they're hurting financially, whether they're hurting uh, physically, isolating, you know, their mental health, whatever it may be, and you have a lot of people who think that the government has overblown it and it's a, uh, a farce and a lot of people who are taking it incredibly seriously. There's two different sense of realities and you have this with a lot of what's been going on. And you know, normally throughout uh, the history of this country, we've had arguments, we've obviously had a civil war, disagreement about you know, fundamental aspects of this country. But right now we have fundamental questions about what reality is and whose reality is correct. How do you function in that type of environment? Well, it's really difficult, though. I want to say, Aaron, that most Americans think um, that it, we need to go slowly in terms of opening up the economy and people going back to work and businesses functioning. Um, and, and so I think it's not like 50-50 disagreement in this uh in this country we know that there are people who who think that this still remains a hoax and we get very i think unhelpful signals from the president of the united states who goes to a, a factory that makes masks and won't wear a mask science is what i think needs to guide us that there really are facts in this world um, there is truth some things are and some things aren't. Um, and sometimes there are gray areas, even when it comes to science, what is the best way that, that we should uh, proceed. Um, but you know, we, we are seeing a, a president, I think, that who on um, just about every score has mismanaged um, this crisis that most other countries have done a better job. 
you know, when you look now at um, both uh, China, which he demonizes now as the um, mastermind behind this uh, pandemic, um, certainly started there, there's no question. But, and, and you look at South Korea, where, you know, they have pretty much eliminated um, the pandemic there um, and are able to go back more to, to normal. You know, we, we see a um, tragic mishandling and a continuous mishandling of, of the situation because of a failure that science matters, that facts matter, that it's not just messaging, it's not just painting a compelling picture, which the president is very good at doing. Yeah. It's what is really happening. And it is very disturbing when this becomes now a partisan kind of issue. There, there's no room at all for partisanship um, right now. This is life and death. This, exactly. Um, you know, we see um, scientists like Tony Fauci, who are not being allowed to justify. Yeah, why isn't he being allowed to testify to Congress? Isn't that the responsibility that, that, that we, we as the American people need to be able to hear from the experts? And the House of Representatives is that forum. Yes, you know, we're, we're about to um, hear from a whistleblower um, um, who is concerned that he was essentially demoted, fired, um, forced to leave because he couldn't criticize the president of the United States um, and disagree, not even criticize, just disagree um, with, uh, with, with the president. Um, Tony Fauci um, has done that even right in front of the president, when the president says, you know, this is gonna, early on when he said, we're gonna get down to zero, we're gonna have a vaccine soon, um, uh, Dr. Fauci would go to the microphone and say, no, I'm sorry, it's still likely to be um, a year, maybe even longer before we have a vaccine. Or when the president says, you know, we had to really look at this issue, of um, you know ingesting bleach and you know uh, th where the um, the experts the people who really know um, in including the Lysol company right <laughs> they put something do, out. Uh, do not in any way ingest drink um, Lysol this is you know a poison you know most of us learn that as children. Right. It, it's a yeah. fundamental thing. But yeah. what are you doing right now? What is the current update of what the government is doing right now to respond? I know you're working on some very critical things for the senior community, right? You know, I've been, I've been working on and focusing a lot on nursing homes where um, a disproportionate number of deaths in this country can be attributed to nursing homes, both the residents and the workers. By the way, I'm happy to say that the workers in the state of Illinois have um, achieved a, um, there's not going to be a strike. They um, got the important things that they wanted. It wasn't mostly about um, wages. It was about sick leave. It was about um, having enough protective gear in the, in the homes. It was really much more about the quality of, of care, which um, for the workers, which influences the quality of care for patients as well. So that's, that's very good news. But we're gonna have a comprehensive bill. And I think um, for our communities, for Evanston and Skokie, one of the concerns has been not only the money that has to be being spent on the pandemic itself. We are um, among the few municipalities that actually have our own health departments, both Skokie and right. Evanston. Um, and so there's been a good deal of money that has been sent in that regard, but it's also just the enormous loss of revenue, of um, sales taxes, of business taxes, you know, people aren't going out into the community and spending. Um, and so the demand across the country from municipalities has been, we need direct help, not just going through the state. 
And so we're going to pass a bill that's going to have, I don't know, I think probably at least a trillion dollars that will be for state, county, and local governments, individually um, d distributed. So we don't have to rely on, uh, on the state. And I think that, that the governor, Governor Pritzker, has been doing a great job, but we don't have to rely on trickle down to municipalities. Um, so it'll come directly to municipalities um, because the, the threshold before was if you were a municipality over 500,000 people, well, you know, none of our northern suburbs, certainly not Evanston, Skokie, um, or any of them. Consolidate. Don't be the skip. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're, we're going to see some relief, and that means that we'll be able to put money into CDBG, that is the um, local funds that go to the um, safety net that we need in our, in our communities. Um, there are, uh, for our first responders, um, we wanna make sure that they have all the equipment that they need, that they're able to take off the time and quarantine if they actually do have the virus and still get their, their paychecks. So there's been a lot of demands on just ordinary things in government, you know, fixing um, roads and um, taking care of the ongoing needs of, of cities. Um, and so um, I, look, I very much look forward to, to that. Um, in addition, you know, I mentioned what, what the way that um, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, describes the next bill, it's about saving lives, saving livelihoods, and saving our democracy. Yeah. And so on the last thing, what we want is something Illinois already has, and that is vote by mail as an option, um, that everybody will have the opportunity to cast their ballot. You know, if there are still people worried when comes election time, and of course there's still primary elections around the country, that um, there will be the option to vote by mail and certainly by November 3rd, so that everybody will have that opportunity to vote any which way they want to. If it's important for people to go on election day, then the states will be permitted to do that, of course, as well. Um, so, you know, we um, don't want to see voter suppression anywhere, and we've seen it in our neighboring states, um, in both Wisconsin and in, in Michigan, um, in the um, 2016 election. So we want to make sure, and even recently in Wisconsin, when right. voters... There were huge lines. Yeah, there were huge lines. They were close to each other. There have certainly been people since then that have gotten the disease. I don't know that it can be directly attributed, um, but you know, every time you go out, um, it, if you're not wearing a mask and you're not doing um, distancing, then you could be um, in danger. You know, I have a few questions about what you just yeah. said. You know, one is in terms of voting. Why can't we go through a system of online voting where there can be high security? I mean, things can happen with mail. Things can happen in person, too, in terms of security and making sure that the votes are correct. But why can't we go to figure out a system where it's digital, where we could increase significantly the amount of votes that people are able to, you know, that everybody could be able to vote? Aaron, are, are there any states doing digital online voting? No, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, not that I'm aware of either. Um, I think that ultimately, and I think that process will be moved along by the, I've heard 30%, sometimes even higher increase in digital communications. Um, but of course the issue of security has been a huge one. Um, we're struggling with that issue right now as members of Congress. Can we um, vote remotely? Right, how do you even conduct Congress right now with everyone being fearful of getting sick? We, uh, um, amazingly, um, you know, we're later today, um, every Monday and Thursday, for a while it was almost every day, um, we have caucus conference calls, 180 people um, have, were on the last one on Monday um, out of 230, I think. So not everybody participated, but a good number. Um, but it's difficult, I agree with you, because um, when we're not there, 
if we have a Q&A period, which we always do, you're not going to get 180 people who may have an opinion that they want to weigh, weigh in on. So what I th believe that we're going to do, and I think we're probably going to go back next week because there will be a vote on the next bill that'll have a lot of relief. So, you know, if our um, government officials and our towns are listening, um, we should come up with that help for local government. Um, there will be a vote on, I believe that it'll come down to proxy voting, that um, people will, that members will be able to designate a person and the exact vote. It's not as if some member is going to give me the right to vote for them how I feel. Yeah. Uh, it'll be on the exact, the exact vote. And then anyone who, and there are people who are compromised, who have um, relatives that they're um, staying with that need help. There's a lot of reasons um, that, that people will not be able to vote or expose themselves to the virus. And so I think a number of people will vote, um, give, a, give a proxy vote. There's still some concern about the security of online voting, remote yeah. voting in, in, in Congress. And so until those are really cleared up, you know, we're on Zoom right now. Um, there's, it's, it's been really recommended that when we have um, things that are, um, uh, I wouldn't say um, classified, but you know, if you, things that you don't want to know that Zoom isn't the best, the best way to, to go. And, you know, hackers have um, sometimes been ahead of our ability to control them. Um, and, and so um, I think it's understandable. But I have to tell you something else, Aaron, in terms of members of Congress, you know, we've identified, or, or the government has identified who's an essential worker. And we include people at the grocery store, in warehouses, who, by the way, are often mailing things out to us that certain aren't that aren't essential, but they have to box them up and, and get them to us. Um, you know, the everyone, even though the postal service is under really illegitimate attack, um, but they're delivering six days a week, very necessary things, often um, prescription drugs, checks, etc. Um, and so, um, I just think that to show visibly that your government is working. Um, I think we need to go to Washington and, and cast those votes. As many of us as, as really can, I think should be there. Um, you know, it's fine for us to ask these other people to, to go to work, right. but I think we're central workers and I think right. we should be there. You're absolutely yeah. essential workers. I mean, it's, it, it's the functioning of our democracy, like you're saying, which is critical. Um, yeah, I, you know, one thing that I think about when you're talking about all these, these basically stimulus packages to be able to help local governments, uh, individual people, the PPP has been a huge thing. Um, and it's been helpful for my business and, and so many others. Um, and it, it, you know, thankful that it got passed. Um, did what you do we get do? Through, did you get through, Aaron, in the first round? Uh, no, in the second round. I did, and my wife has a business, too, and we both were able to get it. Um, and, Good. you know, we, we were uh, with Chase, so it's a large bank, so it took maybe a little bit longer. I know other people have been able to, you know, they, they work with a smaller banker, um, and that might well, be I something we can tell you, and I'm not going to point fingers on any one bank, but in the terms of some of the big banks, we were told first come, first serve. That just simply was not true. No. Uh, they worked, in fact, there were concierge services for some of the big clients of big banks. And um, I kind of get, they probably wanted to protect their biggest loans, um, but I'm sorry. Um, there were, um, I think, on the first round, there was a, only a small percentage, 14% comes to mind, maybe I'm wrong, of just, you know, mom and pop, um, Main Street businesses that actually got through. And um, in the second round, we said it had to, I, I know that my bank, um, it's in Rogers Park, the Devon Bank, never itself as a bank 
made it with all of the people who applied to them at all. So now smaller banks are in line um, and um, minority owned banks, et cetera, in the second round. But you know, still there's people we're hearing from that have not gotten, gotten help. Um, and this may be interesting. I believe that we will show that not for profits that are larger than 500 are going to be able to apply for that, that loan now because I've been hearing from um, organizations that deal with um, people with mental illness and substance abuse and um, uh, persons with disabilities um, that because they're pretty big organizations have not, have been cut out of everything really. Yeah. And I think they'll be included in the next round. I hope so. They do critical work for people and who are who need the help uh, desperately. It was an um, oversight, you know, I think. They didn't apply, they they didn't fit into any category. Yeah. No, I'm glad that they'll be able to be included, I hope. Um and it's, you know, just these small businesses like I had Nina Barrett from Bookends and Beginnings on my show and we were talking a lot about, you know, everything this is a few weeks ago. And, you know, she's in a small business and a bookstore in, in downtown Evanston. And, you know, these types of things are the fabric of the communities. You, you read, um, you know, the Jane Jacobs and what she would always talk about how cities are, uh, how they live. And we need these small businesses. So, you know, it's a let, lot of let money. Me just, let me just reply to that because, you know, I think one of the things I've heard predicted is that we're going to see um, more um mergers and acquisitions, that it will be an opportunity for big companies to eat up some of the smaller companies. That's a real problem right now. There is legislation I am supporting that would um, prohibit um, those mergers and acquisitions until the end of the COVID crisis to make sure that this isn't a time for the sharks to come out and eat the little fish who are really struggling to get the help. That could happen quite a bit. Well, uh, it would be interesting if that were to pass. Um, but, you know, with all the funds, though, are you worried that we're going to run out of money or that U.S. currency will become devalued with all the stimulus? Because Look, this will probably need to go on for a couple of years, realistically, in, until business can recover. Well, in some ways, I mean, I, I think that once, what is essential to really open up is confidence that consumers have that they will be safe. So, you know, the, the president can say everything is open right now. And I assure you that people are not going to go out. I have a birthday this month. You know, normally we might go to a nice restaurant and celebrate and then maybe we'll do a show or a movie or something. None of that is going to happen. And it wouldn't happen no matter what any elected official or uh, bureaucrat said, fine, go, go, go out. Um, and so you can't separate the virus from the economy. And we're gonna have to spend whatever we need to, and then um, gradually begin to open up. And the, gradually we will begin to see that kind of revenue return and investments being made. Now, you notice the stock market, you know, while it took some deep, deep plunges, really has been pretty steady um, for a while, unless I'm, I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> Get changed with a dime. Today, you know? But, um, you, know, you know, so I, I, think, I think we're seeing in the investment community some confidence that we are going to um, come back. But unless ordinary people feel a confidence, it's really not going to happen. And that confidence is based on, am I going to get sick and die? Am I going to, um, uh, you know, make my family, um, you know, come home then from somewhere and give it to them? Which, by the way, is something that frontline workers are really worrying about. Um, that, you know, if they don't have, and they still, in some places, don't have the protective gear they need, which is unforgivable. Unforgivable. Completely. Yeah, um, and that's something that best would be coordinated at the federal level, but it's not. So it's being left to um, the states and to individual nursing homes. It's uh, you know, it's it's just unbelievable how um, set loose. 
these um, frontline workers have have been. But anyway, um, so we're going we're to have to spend what it takes. And that's going to take oversight too, because we did see in that first round that um, some businesses that shouldn't have gotten the money did get the money. Yeah. Um, and that, and we saw tucked into that first CARES bill about $131 billion in tax relief for the richest people come on. And so that's why we have um, oversight mechanisms in, in place now so that we can look out for that kind of um, exploitation um, that, you know, there's, there's people who look at this as an opportunity to price gouge, to, um, you know, do things that uh, are gonna help them personally. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity out there for people to do that, for foreign governments to take advantage of the situation, to inflame our divisiveness. Um, it's, a, it's a serious time. Do you, uh, you know, I wanna ask you some more questions about you and your connection here to the area um, while we have time, but before I ask that, you know, I, um, I went to the University of Illinois and I graduated in the early 2000s. It was after 9-11. And one of the classes that I took was on um, the, you know, how we re, uh, respond to bio warfare and chemical warfare and all these different things. And I remember them talking a lot about the possibility of an aerosol virus being spread among a, a country as, as a act of war, or it could just be an accident. So we're going through something similar to that right now. And, you know, what are we going to do to prepare for the next time something like this happens? Are, are, we, are we taking lessons learned right now like the military does and using that to be able to prepare and prevent something like this from happening, um, you know, in the future? I think opportunities have opened up because the pandemic has opened up these kinds of, of failures, of disparities that have pre-existed for a long time. And now I think we'll be really forced to the, the, the front. Um, before, um, in, in, in 2019, we saw a loosening, for example, in nursing homes of requirements for infection specialists to be present in, in every nursing home. Um, and um, now that's no longer a um, strict requirement um, that you know, we are definitely needing infection specialists. Um, and, and so we, we have an opportunity going forward to fill in so many of the gaps. Another one would be the digital divide has been exposed because distance learning has been hampered by people who don't have that opportunity. That's in rural communities and in urban areas too. Sure. Certainly racial disparities. Um, when we see in the city of Chicago, over 70% of the deaths among African-Americans who make up 20 something percent of 23, 28 maybe percent of the population. Um, and, and so I think we're going to have a great opportunity um, to um, make those kinds of important changes. I think the military is actually a, a good example. You know, in, in, in real wartime, the government has said, you will produce these weapons of, of war. And we have seen a president not willing to use the um, Defense um, Production Act to make sure that we have enough masks and enough uh, gloves for everyone in this in the in this country, um, and um, so I, I'm I'm actually hopeful on that front that the glaring examples of these kinds of disparities will really move the country to do, to have a better public health system, which we desperately need. Um, so, you know, there, there may be, um, a, a, you know, a, a slight silver lining um, to, to all of this that we can do better and prevent these things the next time. Well, I, I would hope that we're able to create a, you know, U.S.-based system to be able to produce the masks 
that we need on a, you know, or whatever we need to have a larger stockpile and, you know, be able to create the testing that we need on a very quick basis where we could just, you know, once you figure out how to test for it, turn it on. Cause that's what we really need. Every, every American citizen, you know, American resident, whoever needs tens of, hundreds of, of tests so we could test each uh, ourselves on a regular basis and millions. know what that's safe. We need millions, um, absolutely. And millions. And even uh, a, a day um, have, to be, ha have to be given. And, you know, they say they're ramping up, but Aaron, we're in May. Right. This is May um, that we're, you know, finally, it seems maybe having that discussion at the, uh, at the, federal, at the federal level. I'm glad you changed from... Um, saying um, citizens to residents because you know what this this virus does not know the difference correct it's and so if we have immigrants who often are frontline workers um, that are getting the disease we we're, we're all at risk we're right. all in the the same bowl here um, and, and so, you know, we see this discrimination against uh, immigrants is not helping us move forward. It doesn't make a difference who you are, where you come from. We're all human, you know, we, and we've got we to gotta think about that. We got to think about that when we think about the world, about the World Health Organization. You know, we need to coordinate. We need a coordinated global effort to really help all of us. I mean, this is the truest global uh, challenge that we have faced um, since World War II. And guess what company, what country did not go to a worldwide gathering of countries to figure out how to work together to stem this pandemic, to end this pandemic? The United States didn't go. We were AWOL, missing yeah. in action. It's a problem. It's frustrating. Um, but you know, the only way to, to break past that frustration in many ways is to become active and involved. Mm -hmm. And you're somebody who's been um, in government for a, a long time and you, you, you've devoted your life to civil service. What got you interested in it? How did you, be, you know, become a representative? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the, four, the, the, the short version of my creation story which actually, Aaron, um, began was I, when I was a very young housewife um, living in uh, Mount Prospect. And a group of women got together because we simply wanted to know how old our food was because every item in the grocery store had a code and not a date. You, you couldn't go through the milk or the package goods and find out how old things were if they were expired and really old. Um, and so we became um, kind of detectives. We would um, go to the stock boys, push them against the shelf, say, how do you know how old the food is? <laughs> and um, uh, we found things that were days, weeks, months, and years beyond the date. We didn't question the dates. Um, and uh, infant formula and baby food were big offenders. And that was particularly disturbing to these young women that we were. We called ourselves modestly National Consumers United. Because we figured everybody wanted to know how old their food was. And so we ran a real campaign. Um, we invited the press when we would do store inspections. Um, and finally, Jewel was the first to say, come to Jewel. We have fresh estates on our house brands. And it, be, it snowballed from there. Um, the Oscar Mayer was one of the first of the brand name products to start putting a, a, a buy by or best, buy, best to, to serve by. Um, and now they're pretty re, re, ubiquitous um, and even internationally somewhat um, finding those dates. Well, that changed me from an ordinary housewife to an ordinary housewife who could really make a difference in the world. I had stopped teaching when I had my two little kids. They were in the cart often when we were doing our inspections in the grocery store. We were threatened with arrest. We said, no, I'm sorry, the kids have to get home for a nap. We can't get arrested today. <laughs> it's not gonna work. Um, lawyers were hired by some of the companies to follow us around. Sometimes we were just shopping and they were looking over our shoulder at shopping lists. Um, but 
you can imagine it was an empowering experience for uh, a, a young person. And it um, was the bug that, that made me see that, you know, an ordinary person who has no title, no credential, um, could actually, when getting involved, make a difference. You know, it, it's not like the hugest difference in the, in the world, but, you know, I see people checking those dates, you know, and it, it's them. very rewarding um, to see that. I'm tempted to say, moi, I did that. <laughs> I don't know, um, but you know, so I, ever since then, really, I've been an activist, an organizer, um, and believe in grassroots, uh, the, the efficacy of grassroots organizing. I'm constantly trying to get people, call your Congress person. It doesn't take more than even 10 calls on a single subject to bring, to bring it to our attention. It makes a real difference. Um, and, and so, um, you know, it led me to run for office. My first race I lost, perhaps one of the most, perhaps the most important race I ran because I learned to be a candidate. I learned to ask for money for someday we'll get the, the money out of politics. Um, and, um, and, and learn more about policy making and, uh, and then ran for the state legislature and won eight years there. And then when that office and one and um and, and ran against jb pritzker by the way he was in that race I oh, really? him. yeah i tease him every now and then about that um and um and i still think of myself as an organizer trying to mobilize people to be partners in this effort to make our country and yes our world better um and i believe we can do it elections really 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 matter i think we're living through an example of that Oh, absolutely we are. And, you know, one of the things that why it matters so much is because when we vote, we're voting for the people to represent our interests. Now, you represent the, the ninth District, which is anywhere from Arlington Heights to Evanston, Wilmette, um, down to into Chicago in, in Rogers Park. How do you represent such a diverse district and, you know, put their, figure out what their interests are? Is it just based on people reaching out to you, or how do you know? Well, you know, I've been doing um, these remote um, conversations with people in, the, um, in our business community, primarily our small business community, um, with people who live throughout the, the, the district. Um, we are taking calls, I wanna tell you, Aaron, we always have gotten every now and then a call of an adult weeping, that happens. Oh boy. It is much more common now. People are feeling desperate. I'm a, pro I'm a progressive Democrat. My interest is in everyday people. Um, you know, the, 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 the big companies, the wealthy Americans, they have the wherewithal to lobby themselves for themselves and to speak out for themselves and have a disproportionate amount of power already. It's just regular people like me, I, I mean, that's how, that's my background. I grew up in um, West Rogers Park. I went to Rogers School. I graduated from Sullivan High School that I'm very, very involved with. Most, it's in some, it was called um, Immigrant High um, in Chicago Magazine. It's a very different um, school um, demographically, but it's the regular people from that, uh, that, that district. Um, and, and so that's, that is really my mission. Healthcare in large part drew, drove me originally that every American is deserving of healthcare as a right. We're still not there. We're seeing it really in high relief right now. Um, and um, I'm fighting right now to make sure that any vaccine or effective therapy is accessible and affordable for every single person. Um, free would be, uh, you know, if you don't have insurance, it should be free oh, to you. It should be, you know, because so those are the things that have always driven me. Yeah, no, the, it, and yeah, I was just going to say it should be free because if we're spending so much money on things to help business and community, that is the, the, 
the the silver bullet, the, the that vaccine. So if we could, everyone can get it, and then we have complete immunity. It's it it would be amazing. And by the way, you and all taxpayers have also invested in those products. We put a lot of money into the the CDC, into the National Institutes of Health to do the preliminary scientific work to develop those products. And so we cannot allow companies to get exclusive patents and charging an arm and a leg for those after the major multi, multi billion dollar investments in the development of those um, drugs and those therapies. So, um, you know, it's something we're gonna have to really watch carefully to make sure that that happens that people can afford it, that it's free. It's critical. It's really critical. Um, you know, if somebody though wants to take your path and become involved in, in government or having a voice in the community, how do you, what do you recommend people do? How do they get involved? You know, um, th this is the time. If you have a particular interest um, and, you know, you, if, you, if you are ambitious about running for office or, you know, you want to raise your profile in an organization that is doing good, good work. We see leaders of the environmental movement that are deciding to run for office. And by the way, young people are running for office. I just did um, an endorsement video for someone who is running to be the head of the high school Democrats. Huh. And so I endorsed him and, uh, you know, did a video for, for him. I'm always trying to lift um, young people to, to choose to, to run for office. Um, we, we see young people now on school boards, um, on um, local, um, um, uh, their aldermen and city council members um, uh, around the um, district now that are, that are young and diverse representing different different communities. Um, and sometimes, so when you make a name for yourself as a leader of something, it can be a neighborhood organization, it can be an issue organization, um, gun violence, um, uh, the environment, um, you know, and you can get involved in elections. Elections are based on merit. I'll never forget going into an office in, uh, in a city in Iowa, where the woman who was running the office was all of 18 years old. Why? Because she had gotten involved in that campaign and was so incredibly productive and organized that yes, she could boss around the senior citizens and all the uh, other adults that were there and mobilize young people to do it. It's their merit based. Get involved in a local campaign, uh, a national campaign, um, my campaign where um, we're, we're putting people all over the place. And by the way, right now, what we're doing is a good neighbor project um, because we want to make sure that it through, it's through my campaign and we're organizing all through the county, through democratic organizations, people who want to get involved in calling people who might be vulnerable, um, if they need help. And about 5% of the people that we call actually need something, but we're glad to help them. They need wheel, um, meals on wheels. They need um, to get in, on the SNAP program, which is the food stamp program, or they um, want some groceries delivered to their, to their house. Um, and we make that happen. But most of them just want to talk. A lot of people who are isolated right now, this is really a breeding ground for um, mental illness or just anxiety. And so we're getting people just to do check-in calls and, and chat with people. Um, and so if you want to get involved in the Good Neighbor Program, you can contact my office and we can, uh, can help do that. And there's other, many other things that are happening in Evanston um, that food pantries and delivering of food and, you know, check it out. Yeah, and there's such a lot, such a great amount of goodwill being done by people um, right now all around um, the area, helping the homeless, helping people who are in dire straits, the Niles Township Food Pantry. Yep. 
Yeah. You know, it's and been... you know, people have never been in line before are in line. And I heard about, I think it, I can't remember the state, might have been Pennsylvania, two miles of cars in line to get food. In the United States of America, the richest country in the world. Aaron, this is one of the issues that we have to grab by the horns and do something about. It's not right. It's scary. And, and that's why it's so important to get involved. You know, for me, I've, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a real estate agent. I've been involved in real estate for, for years. And I always just had a more of a uh, passion to be involved in things around the world. And um, I've got myself very involved at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Yeah. And what's amazing to me, what I've learned in even doing this show and having this conversation with you right now, is that if you're able to put together the effort and start to make those connections, you have the ability to have tremendous access to people. I've sat in rooms with people that I am pinching myself, that I'm asking, being able to ask them questions about things that are going on in the world that they have a direct effect on, just like right now. And I think that could be an inspiration to people to get involved. I absolutely agree with you. People know your power, know your own power and exercise it. And you will be surprised like Aaron just um, said he was about the, the connections that you can make um, to, to, to people, to authors, to you know all kinds of people who are ready and willing, if you'll do something and participate, to deal with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's empowering. It sure is. Yes. So if people want to be able to find out what's going on uh, with you and government, uh, how do you suggest they go ahead and, and follow that? Um, you know, people who, um, you know, can, can go to um, my website, that's easy to find. You can um, call me at 773-506-7100. Um, that's an office number. Uh, things are busy, but we um, try very hard within a half an hour to get back to, um, to, to people. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably one of the easiest people to find on, online. Um, and we do put out, um, uh, on our website, we have a lot of information about the programs that are available. But if you haven't gotten that check, for example, and you know you make less than $75,000, um, and you didn't get your check for $1,200 for yourself, $500 for every child, and by the way, um, we're pushing for not only uh, another um, check to be sent out, but a, a lot of us are pushing for monthly checks to go out until this is over. Because we hear from people, yeah, I got my check. Doesn't pay the rent. No, you know? it doesn't pay the rent. And, and any help with unemployment. And there's, you know, in my line of work as a real estate agent, a lot of us are independent contractors. So it's the first time people are trying to figure out how to file for unemployment because it's allowed. It's like a huge navigating pond um, to, should you do PPP? Should you, you know, can you get your stimulus? So I think what you've been putting out also, your weekly emails have been very important. And, you know, just to, so everyone knows, go to shakowski.house.gov and that's where you can get all that information. Right. Yeah. Well, Congresswoman, this has been an absolute thrill. I'm going to let you go so you can um, take care of the, the business of our country. And we appreciate your service. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Well, to well let, let, me, let me thank you. I mean, I think you provide a service to our community as well, Aaron. Thank you very, very much. I hope maybe we can actually maybe have a face-to-face -face breakfast sometime. I would love to. Uh, yeah, yeah, in the district. Okay, great. <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you everybody for watching and